I think, you know, many of the challenges that we talked about, I'm talking about technocracy and the global political consensus. Many of the challenges and debates that we have today in, are centered around what it means to be a human being and what it means to lead an authentic human life. Um, and this has profound consequences for liberty, for economic liberty, uh, for family liberty. Benedict XVI, the former pope, said that after the fall of the Soviet Union, relativism did not die, nor did the underlying problems of socialism and the denial of God go away. Rather, he said, relativism mixed with a desire for gratification. So relativism mixed with a desire or combined with a desire of, for gratification to form a potent mix. Um, <clears throat> and so you'll notice on the top of the handout, I provided some quotes which really provide an underlying theme of some of the things I'm going to talk about today. So let's look at them briefly. The first one is obviously from Genesis. Come, it says, let us build for us a city and a tower whose, t I think there's a, an edit, there's a typo here. Come, let us build for a, 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 a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. Come, let us build for us a tower that will reach into heaven and let us make for us a name. Now, of course, if we know, reading the scriptures, that it is God who gives the name. God says, I will give you a name. I will give, give you your descendants. And here in the Tower of, ba Tower of Babel, there's this grasping for a name. So just as Adam and Eve grasped for the fruit to become like God, so we see in the Tower of Babel the city, the technocracy, grasping to become like God. The second two, two quotes, or three quotes, are from one of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, uh, The Abolition of Man. He says, I'm very doubtful whether history shows us one example of a man having stepped outside traditional morality and attained power, has ever used that power benevolently. The second quote is, and it's very important as we think about modern political consensus, for the power of man to make himself what he pleases means, as we have seen, the power of some men to make other men what they please. And then the final quote, I hope will provide the, found the kind of underlying ideas of this talk, is again from the abolition of man. He says, quote, at the moment then of man's victory over nature, we find the whole human race subjected to some individual men, and those individuals subjected to that in themselves, which is purely natural. That is, their raw desires, their passions. To their irrational impulses, Men, man's final conquest has proved to be the abolition of man, end quote. So <clears throat> since we're in the political season and we're getting to listen to Professor Donald Trump and um, Ambassador Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders and Marco Rubio debate over how one drinks water during a lecture, I thought I would give you a break from all that. <laughs> All right, um, and, and, and we're going to do a little bit of philosophical analysis. And I'm going to try my best, Mike, to not include any William Clinton. Okay, I love it. That's a great guy. I, mean, I love that guy. Okay, so now here's the summary. So much of modern political and social analysis kind of uses an interpretive grid of a tension between what we'll call liberalism and capitalism on one hand. And by the way, I don't mean like liberalism of you know, John Kerry and, and, and Bill Clinton. I mean like liberalism broadly as a historical project, okay? Um, uh, so kind of capitalism and the liberal society on one hand, and then on the other hand, socialism and communism or fascism on the other. Uh, now, for years it was actually unfashionable to talk about socialism. In fact, I gave a lecture at this Acton Lecture Series in 2007 that I called the victory of socialism, question mark, where I said, you know, so economics, theoretically, market economics have won the day, but perhaps socialism won the culture. And I said, I know it's not fashionable to talk about socialism. This was before the bailout of the banks, before President Obama, before Bernie Sanders. 
And in fact, there was a, a person in the audience, a, a wonderful uh, scholar, who said, you shouldn't use the word socialism. You were wrong to use the word socialism. And we had kind of a debate uh, about that. It was very interesting. Um, but now, of course, socialism, in fact, is very much back, right? And we, even people are talking about it, that we have a presidential candidate who's a declared uh, socialist. So, however, while I do think socialism is an issue, and I don't want to underestimate uh, the importance of these debates, I actually think there's something more pressing. And talk of socialism, um, even though I do use the term, can be a distraction, can be a distraction. So what I would say is in the last 25 years, what has emerged is neither kind of liberal capitalism, as we understand it, or kind of socialist planned economies, but a new type of political hybrid. Okay? It's not a Hegelian synthesis for all of the uh, philosophers out there. No Hegelian synthesis. But it is an amalgamation of different trends, of things going on. Part of that, of course, is because socialism is the intellectual child of liberalism. Right? But that's a whole other discussion. So it's, there's this amalgamation of these things going on, this kind of connection. So what we have is a new kind of global secular consensus that has become the dominant political ethos in Europe, North America, um, international organizations like the World Bank, the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, all of which exert tremendous pressure also on the developing world. So this is, that's why I say it's a global kind of consensus. And so from this global consensus, I think there are emerging certain social challenges um, that include everything from population control in the developing world, which I'll talk about. Um, I, I don't know if you understand there's a serious problem uh, the Economist magazine has called it gender side, where hundreds of millions of baby girls have been aborted uh, because of bad economics and bad anthropology. Um, from so, so you see these threats to religious liberty, eugenics, marriage, and consumerism. So what I'd like to do is the follows. First, I'd like to spend the majority of the time here kind of outlining some of the characteristics of the current political and economic. Well, actually, no, that's right. I'd like to do briefly, kind of outline some of the characteristics of the, of the political and economic context, right? Of what I see as this global consensus, right? Um, and technocracy, of course, is one aspect of it. And then in the second part of my talk, which will be really the majority of the talk, I'd like to go through some of the kind of underlying philosophical um, ideas that shape our new political ethos. Uh, and then um, I'll give a couple of challenge after that, some of the concrete things, and then conclude. So before going any further, I'd just like to a couple of limiting demarcations. First of all, I'm focused on certain global international political culture that's dominant, as I said, in Europe and North America, but also influential in international organizations. Okay, I'm not suggesting it applies everywhere, but I'm suggesting that it applies into this kind of dominant Western internationalist outlook. Um, second, I'm going to do some critiques of what would be called kind of liberalism, broadly understood, okay? Not John Kerry, um, you know, Hillary Clinton. I'm talking about liberalism broadly understood. Um, uh, but I'm in no way assume because I'm focusing on that, I want you to hear that I'm in no way assuming some type of moral equivalence uh, between Democratic, uh, social, de sorry, democratic capitalism or social democratic capitalism in its ver various forms and applied socialism, right? Applied socialism crushed the human spirit. It killed millions of innocent people, destroyed families, and destroyed opportunity and freedom. And there's a reason we never saw mass immigration to the Soviet Union, nor do we see mass immigration to North Korea or Venezuela today. So. I say that because I'm going to spend time on critiquing kind of mo modern social democratic life in the West. And so sometimes, you know, it, you, we can have this almost sense like, oh, you know, they're all kind of equal. Like, no, they're not equal. Okay. Stalin killed about 60 million people. Th this is not an equal. But, but I'm, that's not what I'm focusing on. All right. So with those caveats, let's move forward. So part one is really the global technocracy and the political context of the new social challenges. After the fall of the Soviet Union, there was a profound sense, some euphoric, others very disappointed, that capitalism had won the day, right? That we had ended, like Francis Fukuyama said, we were at the end of history. 
Now, the collapse of, of communism did indeed usher in a new global order, especially economic globalization, the opening up of market economies that has resulted in an unprecedented impact on reducing poverty. Poverty has been reduced more in the last 25 to 50 years than in any time through history. Right? And it's not through foreign aid, it's not through charity, it's actually through opening up markets, enabling people to get access to what, what we call institutions of justice, things like title to their land, ability to engage in market exchange, that has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and is doing so. Africa has a middle class that is larger than the population of the United States. India's middle class, they say, is about 500 million people. Right? So we are seeing a tremendous activity because of this globalization. Um, and most of all, it liberated millions from Soviet tyranny. Yet, at the same time, the victory, uh, uh, the victory of capitalism and democracy was not so clear-cut. Underlying this fact was highlighted by Alexander Solzhenitsyn and others that many of the anthropological assumptions and moral assumptions of modern social democratic life are very similar to that of socialism. At the time, Cardinal Ratzinger, who later became Benedict XVI, Ex expressed similar concerns. He said, despite the fall of communism, the dominant ideas of Marxism, okay, and listen, the myth of progress, right, that we can create heaven on earth, <clears throat> the self-sufficiency of the scientific and technological <clears throat> mindset, political utopianism, and materialism and the denial of God, he said, still, quote, characterize Western civilization as a whole. Okay, think about that for a minute. If we think about this idea of technology, the myth of progress, we're gonna have political utopianism, this is where you see the populist elements, and then the denial of God and materialism are dominant throughout the West, even after the fall of the Soviet Union. So what's emerged especially in the last decade, is not so much, I would argue, the victory of democracy and free market economies over socialism and communism. And again, I'm not understating the, 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 the enormity of the Soviet Union and, the, and their acts. But rather what's emerged is a political hybrid that combines bureaucratic political centralization, managerial capitalism, which immediately becomes crony capitalism, and a socialist liberal culture. Okay, so let me explain each briefly. The first is political centralization. In the contemporary social democracies, the state is involved in almost all sectors of human life, from health to family policy, care for children and the elderly, charity, business, science, research, and education. The state creates layers of complex rules, what Alexis de Tocqueville called soft despotism, that encourage individualism and crowd out intermediary institutions and reshape the family. Okay, what do I mean by encourage individualism? This is something that's extremely important, and some of you have heard me talk about it before. It's one of the great insights of Tocqueville. Individualism, says Tocqueville, leads to political centralization. Right. Individualism leads to political centralization because when the individual turns into himself and forgets what's going on and is not, um, no longer involved in churches or family or local politics, right, it creates this small little individual, it removes the intermediary associations, and then you have a state. And if you think about it for a moment, under whose authority are you really? Under whose authority, say, is my wife? Is she under my authority? Is she under the church's authority? Under whose authority is she? She's under the state's authority. There's no other authority. Now, I'm partially exaggerating, but not really. Think about no-fault no fault divorce laws and a host of other things. So you have this, this individualism where you have a little individual in the state. Now, what happens in this idea of political centralization is it identifies community and solidarity with the political community. It identifies community and solidarity, not with the family and the church and the local groups, but identifies it with the political community. 
and sees other forms of attachments, regional attachments, church attachments, etc., as obstacles first to emancipation, right? Like the church, don't tell me what to do. Let me do what I want to do. And second of all, an obstacle to political consolidation. So Tocqueville has a line I think is worth kind of pondering. He says, the tyrant does not care whether you love him or not, as long as you do not love one another. The tyrant doesn't care as you love him, as long as you don't love one another. The second one is managerial capitalism. Now, in contrast to the popular image of kind of unrestrained capitalism and free markets, the reality is very different. What we have instead of a quote unquote free market is we have highly managed economies that benefit the elites and the well connected. So here in Europe and the United States, sorry, here in the United States and in Europe as, as well, the state controls on average 40% of the economy. Okay, and this has led to a crony capitalism where elites get benefits at the expense of everyone else. Okay, I give you the banking crisis. Okay, the financial crisis in the U.S. and the subsequent bailout are prime examples of crony capitalism. Um, it's worth noting, by the way, that John Maynard Keynes, right, that evil Keynesian, he was actually the first Keynesian. He was amazing. All right, uh, you know, he actually thought that 25% would be the highest limit right, of state control of the economy. We have 39 or 40 here in the United States and on average 40 in Europe. Okay, So there is a myth of unrestrained capitalism. Okay, This has, and I'm going to talk about the, another example for the poor, but this has terrible consequences for the poor. Terrible. Because every talk, time we talk about unrestrained capitalism, what do we need to do? We need to restrain capitalism. And how do you restrain capitalism? You regulate. And who do you think writes the regulations? Benevolent bureaucrats? No. Okay. Entrenched bureaucrats who are in cahoots with large corporations and small ones too, but mostly large ones who have lobbyists, right? And entrenched political classes who then create systems that make it very difficult for the poorest of the poor or even small and medium entrepreneurs to kind of penetrate this disastrous bureaucracy because they don't have all the political contacts and the lawyers and everybody else. And this gets even worse in the global poverty industry. We showed you a little bit of the Poverty Inc. Um, uh, trailer there. But in the United States and Europe, we, we put up tariffs on imports. We subsidize our agriculture to protect large corporations. We overproduce. And then we either give the food away as foreign aid or we encourage, encourage small countries to lower their tariffs. And then we dump it in their countries and destroy local markets. So the same thing that we complain about to China, like, oh, they're dumping. That's what we're doing. We're just doing it to small countries without armies. All right. So the Guardian newspaper <coughs> reported that out of $1 billion in food aid, 70%, that's $700 million, went to three large companies in the US. So again, we often hear religious leaders and others say, you know, poor people are dominated by markets. Ladies and gentlemen, poor people are not dominated by markets. Poor people are excluded from markets. They are locked out. And then the final element of this kind of trifecta is socialist culture, okay, or a socialist liberal culture. So first is political centralization. The second is managerial capitalism, right? And by the way, this is actually really important. It's a real problem because you know, what you saw after the fall of the Berlin, Berlin Wall, people like Tony Blair and, and, and Bill Clinton, I love that guy. He, <clears throat> I feel your pain too. I was there in the 90s. Those were good times. We were wealthy. Anyway, what they did is they created managerial econo economies. And when, the, when all their managerial economies fell, and what we saw in the, in the financial crisis, they, who did they blame? They blamed free markets. So they lost faith in markets, but they didn't lose faith in themselves. And they said, no, we're going to come and help you. No, you're the ones who caused the problem in the first place. And this is a real serious problem, because when most people think about free markets, they think managerial capitalism. But they call it free markets, right? And this is a, a, a serious problem. But anyway, OK, so the, and the last part is socialist culture. Antonio Gramsci was an Italian socialist, a Marxist, and he wrote, 
He said, we need to make a long march through the institutions of culture, okay? A long march. And if we look at universities, media, arts, major cultural institutions, they are guided by relativism, secularism, individualism, and a techno-utopian vision of progress. Things that were unthinkable and radical 50, 70 years ago are considered totally normal today. And in fact, to question them is to be branded as intolerant. <clears throat> Pardon me. Socialist ideas <clears throat> about autonomy, family, marriage, culture, and the arts have moved from a small minority to a widespread influence. As Cardinal Ratzinger has written, quote, Marxism was only the radical execution of an ideological concept that even without Marxism largely determines the signature of our age. I think this is worth, again, thinking about it, right? Because sometimes we're like Marxist, socialist, but we have to actually pay attention to what's going on underneath it. Marxism, see here again, quote, is a radical execution of an ideological concept that even without Marxism largely determines the signature of our age. So what I'd like to do now then is talk about that signature of our age. And this is, of course, very complex. I'm going to simplify it. I'm going to give seven things that I think um, characterize the dominant political consensus. All right. So um, the first one, the over, I guess the first two would be the overarching context of the global political culture are relativism and empiricist rationality. OK? And I'll talk about both of those, so don't worry. But both of which make any kind of concept of rational discourse about the fundamental questions of human life, justice, truth, beauty, goodness, right, wrong, mercy, compassion, impossible. OK, so let me go through them, all right, um, one by one. So the first one is relativism. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. You, you all know the problem with relativism, OK? All right, it's the rejection of truth and universals. But one thing it's very important to remember is relativism necessarily leads to ideology. All right? If you reject, and you'll hear me say this probably twice in this lecture, maybe more, if you reject a philosophical approach, what I mean by philosophical is philosophos, love of wisdom. If you reject a philosophical approach to life, which is a pursuit of truth, right? Socrates was asked, should we call ourselves sophos, like the philosophers? He says, no, only God is sophos. We should be philosophos, lovers of wisdom. If we're lovers of wisdom and pursuing something, then we're in this, what Plato would call a dialogical understanding and seeking after truth. When we reject truth, philosophy is impossible and it is reduced to ideology and indoctrination, which of course is exactly what an education is now, right? That's right, it's in, and it can be nothing else. Education, university education especially, but high school and university education without truth can only be indoctrination. And political, it has, it's a political indoctrination, and that's why there, it's intolerant. That's why you have this kind of like pushing out any type of real dialogical relationship. Now it's dialogue, which means capitulation to the secular left. So, so relativism, but it also has profound impact for um, politics, right? Because, and, and you see how this connection to reason, which I'll talk about, because if there's no truth, then we're reduced to what? To power and efficiency. All right, and that relates to the second point, which is again an overarching theme. And that's how we've reduced reason to the empirical. Like I told you, this is not a Republican or Democratic rally, okay? So you can watch that tonight on Fox News, you get a reprieve from the political debates today, okay, with philosophy. All right, a little bit of, little bit of lunch philosophy. David Milroy came here to sleep, so don't worry about it. You won't be the only one. All right. All right, so reason, and this is important, okay? We have reduced reason to the empirical. We've reduced reason to the empirical. What do, what do I mean by that? Well, we have said that in order for something to be rational, a rational discourse. It needs to be empirical, demonstrable, measurable, 
Okay, this is wood, it's so high. You know, this is uh, uh, made of uh, silk, I'm handsome, right? It's like empirically verifiable things, all right, that everybody can agree upon, right? Um, and so what we've done is, that's part of reason we've reduced it to that. We've reduced it to the empirical. And this is a problem on two reasons. Number one, it's incoherent on its own terms. Why is it incoherent on its own terms? Because you can't demonstrate empirically, you can't prove empirically that reason is only empirical. You can't. Now, it makes us laugh a bit. But notice, that's why ra empiricist rationality is always violent and indoctrinating. Because like, wait, the emperor has no clothes. Yes, he does. Marx has a wonderful line. He was asked a question about something that was a little bit erroneous in his thinking. He said, that's not a question for socialist man. Right? So that, first of all, it's incoherent. But more important, it takes the fundamental human experiences, those things that are most important for us as human beings, love, beauty, mercy, forgiveness, kindness, gentleness, tenderness, charity, justice, truth, and goodness, and it relegates them outside the realm of reason. So they just become feelings that we feel. Now, actually, this is a whole other lecture on, on how this vitiates the human being. And in your reading list, I, I, at, the, at the end, I suggest you read C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man, which is, I think, one of the most important books in the 20th century. But it also has profound impacts for politics because politics is in the realm of reason. Because politics is about what? Politics is supposed to be about justice. That's what politics is supposed to be about. But if there's no truth and justice is outside the realm of reason, then politics gets reduced to one of two things. As I've already said, it gets reduced to power or efficiency. Now, we're a gentle people. Right? We're not fascists or communists. We're not just rawly exercising power. No, no, no. But we're an efficient people. And when there's no philosophy, who determines truth? Either the stronger or, no, 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 we're gentle. We have a consensus, an efficient consensus. And again, I want you to start to think about how this starts to play out. Right? I'm not going to go into all the details. I'll let you think about how this plays out, but it's extremely important. So those are the first, those are the first two. All right, so let me go into like now kind of five other kind of key things. I'll go quickly. The first, or the, the next thing I'd like to talk about is egalitarianism or equality. All right, Alexis de Tocqueville wrote in his preface to Democracy in America that the driving force of history over the last 800 years was equality. This commitment to equality, of course, has many positive impacts, right, and positive elements. Much of the impetus behind equality comes from the Jewish and Christian commitment to the dignity of every individual. Equality has been a positive force against injustice. It has created opportunity for millions of families to live both materially richer lives, free from oppression, and to have the ability to do things that, they f that are important to them and not be determined by someone else. Yet, as Tocqueville warned, equality also has a dark side. It engenders a love of comfort, a turning inward into the self, a devaluing of what is good and noble, and a vulgarization of art and culture that reduces everything to the lowest common denominator. It also creates the conditions for, I'm going to use a French word, for resentment, which is different from resentment, but it's like a sour grapes. Remember the, the, the fox and the sour grapes? Oh, I can't get that. I can't achieve that. Because I can't achieve that, ah, it was sour. If, moder if, the, if the average man can't achieve a certain thing, well, it must not be any good anyway. And you see this start to culturally impact the way we see things, right? So we have to tear down what's good and beautiful and true, and we're going to replace it with just kind of mediocre what's accessible to the average. Now, this is most obvious in art and music, but we see the force of equality in, in, in Christianity. In the Catholic Church, for example, in the recent synod, 
on the family, there were debates like, can we really exclude anyone from communion? And one of the bishops said, you know, it's just too hard to remain faithful to your marriage. You just can't really do it. So let's just give everybody a break, okay? If you look at the way um, liturgy and, and doctrine develops through e equality, most mainline Protestantism is very, is almost indistinguishable from the New York Times editorial page, right? Now, Tocqueville, now by the way, Tocqueville predicted all this stuff, okay? Tocqueville said equality would have a great attraction in democratic societies because it nourishes our desire for gratification and comfort and because it gives us immediate benefits and we can't really see the dangers. Like, what's wrong with equality? If somebody walked up on the street and you said, what's wrong with equality? You said, well, nothing. Equality's great because there's so many wonderful things to equality. And inequality, especially when it's the result of injust injustice, is a terrible thing. But Tocqueville says, yeah, but there's dark sides to it. All right, and the negatives are hard to diagnose. He actually predicted that equality would have such a force that the dominant religion of democratic societies would be pantheism. That's what Tocqueville predicted in the 1830s. He said equality would make the distinction between God and man hard to bear. And so men would look to the earth and to each other as the measure. This actually has impact on consumerism, which I'm going to talk about at the end. Because if you're always looking at the Joneses as the measure of your life, then you've got to keep up with them. The attraction, of course, of environmentalism today, especially to urban elites who have never had a garden, would be no surprise to Tocqueville. And so equality becomes, a, becomes especially dangerous when it's divorced from any consideration of human nature. So human nature now is an obstacle to equality. Think about it. Human nature is an obstacle to equality. Like, why can't men get pregnant? Who's to say? Yet as Pope Benedict and Pope Francis recently have stressed, there is such a thing as human ecology, which means that man, too, has a nature that must be respected. Now, many of the social challenges, as I said, from, from, from marriage and gender theory to consumerism are deeply influenced by equality. And because I used to, I sometimes joke, like when, I, when I'll talk to, you know, students and like, like I say, you know, by the way, if you ever want to go into, like if you don't want to go into politics, but you're feeling really pressured from your family to go into politics, like, you know, it's the family tradition, you've got to go into politics. I said, here's how you get to do both, right? Go into politics, obey your parents, and argue against equality. Like, I think equality's wrong. I mean, can you imagine, like, you'd have like one vote. Right? So you can't really go out and critique equality. All right? See, luckily, see, I don't have any friends to lose, so it's a lot easier for me to say these things. Okay? But if you have friends, you don't want to be talking bad about equality. But again, it's a real problem, and we have to, we have to think about it, not in a, in a politically charged way, but like, okay, in a, in a human way. Right? And what does it mean, uh, and how does it affect us? And I think one of the best ways to, to kind of think through these things that I try to do with myself you say, okay, not how does it affect that person I hate <laughs> or, you know, the Democrats or the Republicans. Like, how does it affect the way we actually see ourselves and understand our own relationships? And I think that, that gives us a sense that, boy, we are living in a global consensus that maybe we don't sufficiently kind of question. Like, I mean, I will I'll listen to podcasts of people who are radical thinkers outside the box. I'm like, yeah, right. Let's go through a list of everything that's dominantly popular, and you believe all of them, right? And so, so I think it, this is partly what I'm kind of questioning, right? All right. So the second one is, or the, the next one, the third one, I should, or fourth one, I guess it is. I'm not counting. I'm not, I was never good at math. I was really good at accounting, though, Tom. Um, okay. So is the, the next one is a liberty or autonomy of the will. Okay, and this is that liberty is understood as radical autonomy or exercise of the will, right? Freedom is merely exercise of the will. 
It's separated from any consideration of reason or truth. Right? And the example I sometimes give, give to understand what I mean by this is, imagine after this lecture, I said, you know, thank you so much for coming to the Acton Institute. Um, and I started banging my head on the corner of this table and blood was just spurting out everywhere. You would not say, wow, that guy is free. Okay, you would think that I had lost my mind because an irrational will is not a free will. An irrational will is not a free will. And so we can see, we see this idea that whatever can be done should be done. Utility and pleasure are our only guides because remember, we don't have truth. We don't have reason. Who, who's to judge? Who's to say? So remember that quote from Lewis, it goes down to our deepest natural impulses, irrational impulses. Passion determines reason. But it's a diabolical freedom because any freedom separated from truth and reason is ultimately self-destructive and abolishes man and the person. And that's why remember that radical emancipation from any constraints of truth, we think of it applying to sexuality or to art or to music. I'm just going to express myself as an artist and all that kind of stuff. Okay? I also think beauty is objective, but that's another debate. All right. So we tend to think of it as like sexuality or art, but it actually applies to politics and technology and power. Remember Lewis's warning that man's power over nature is always some men's power over other men. All right. The next is humanitarianism. And this is a, a third, I mean, I'm sorry, I keep getting my numbers wrong. A characteristic of this kind of new liberal socialist hybrid is humanitarianism. This is not new, but it's become more potent after the, over the last several decades. Um, and we talk, this really is an underlying theme of the Poverty Inc. film, but that humanitarianism is a secular, hollowed out version of Christian love. On the outside, it appears the same concern for the poor and the downtrodden. But it is a sentimental love that has limited horizons. It stops at merely providing comfort and relieving suffering, which are good, but not the end of man. Man is not simply called to have comfort and to be taken care of. Man, there's a spiritual capacity in man. Obviously, from a Christian perspective, we see this, the imago dei, but even from a non-Christian perspective, you can just idea that, that we're not just called to just sit there and receive stuff. As Daniel says beautifully, no one wants to be a beggar for life. And as C.S. Lewis says powerfully, you've never met a mere mortal. Right? We have a spiritual capacity, and humanitarianism fails to see this. So we have to contrast humanitarianism with Christian love. Right? Caritas, Christian love, which has traditionally been understood as to seek the good of the other, to will the other person's good. In Latin, the intensio benevolentia. So let's see Trump try to use some Latin. Okay. All right. The intensio benevolentia, the intentional desire for the benevolence of the other person, where we think about human flourishing. But that's not how, what shapes the way we engage our, our relations with others, and the poverty industry is a prime example. Okay, now the humanitarian ethic is a sentimental ethic. It feels feelings on behalf of the poor and the weak. It loves them only because they are weak. And it bestows on us a sense of superiority that's often exploited for political action. Pay attention to this. Humanitarian love is very different from a gospel attitude to the poor, which is rooted in the truth of the person. Benedict XVI said beautifully, when charity is separated from truth, it degenerates into sentimentalism, to sentimentality. Now, here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. Sentimentalism is a thin veneer, a super thin veneer. And it fades away quickly. And beneath sentimentalism is a condescension, a superior condescension and disregard for the poor as backward and simple who just don't know what they need. But me, the upper middle class white technocrat, I know what you need. 
let me do it for you. We see this here in the United States and Europe. We even see it in the churches. The editor of the German bishop's website said the only reason the church is quoting it in Africa is because what he called the editor of the German Catholic bishop's website said the church is growing in Africa because what he calls the dark continent are socially dependent and have nothing else but their faith. Like feel the condescension, right? Because humanitarianism replaced Christian love. He said the faith grows because of the educational situation is low and the people accept simple answers to difficult questions like those that Cardinal Seurat of Guinea provides, end quote. Really? Africans are Christians because they're stupid. Now I understand. Do they know it's Christmas? Yes, they're poor. They're not stupid. They're excluded. They're not stupid. Notice the just dripping condescension. And it becomes most profound in population control programs. The problem with you people is there's too many of you. It's never said that way, is it? It's never said that way. It's always said under the veil of we care. Have small families. Of course, we know what happens when you are encouraged to have small families, don't we? When people are encouraged to have small families, what kind of child do they choose? They choose boys. And so that's what we have what the New York Times has called the daughter deficit and what Economist Magazine, as I mentioned, has called gender side. All in the name of care for the poor, humanitarianism, social engineering. I actually have a quote on your handout. It's a little bit later, but I think it's time to read it here. If you scroll, if you scroll, if you scroll down on your handout, just like that on the paper. There's a quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, I live in the managerial age, the world of admin. No offense. Okay. In the world of admin, the greatest evil is not now done in those sordid dens of crimes that Dickens loved to paint. It's not even done in concentration camps and labor camps. It's in those that we see its final result. But it's conceived and ordered, moved, seconded, carried, misminuted in clean carpeted, warmed, and well-lighted offices by quiet men with white collars and cut fingernails and smooth-shaven cheeks who do not need to raise their voices. Hence, naturally enough, says Lewis, my symbol for hell is something like the bureaucracy of a police state or the office of a thoroughly nasty business concern. One of the, the, so we see everything from major humanitarian agencies and population control, eugenics, st sterilization, including forced sterilization. I don't know if you know this, these organizations will sometimes forcefully sterilize poor women for their own good. We have that here in the United States. Going into poor African American communities and sterilizing the women. Because you know they're animals. No. Humanitarianism is very different from Christian love. Pay attention. One of the great challenges of Christian charitable work is in fact not to absorb humanitarianism as its guiding principle. The next one of course is technocracy and techno-utopianism. This is what, this actually Lewis calls it technocracy. All problems, social, economic, human problems are technical problems to be solved. Never a mystery to be experienced or contemplated. The pervasiveness of technological responses, not just in science or poverty or sickness, technology is seen as the solution to happiness, sexuality, age, um, education, old age, even love and death can be solved by technology. The techno-utopian mixed with radical autonomy. Notice the connection. It says that whatever can be done, should be done. Whatever is possible should be possible. And we have this idol, idol of progress that is opposed to Christian hope. Christian hope recognizes that progress is good, but it must be limited and tempered by hope, which is the confident expectation, expectation that Jesus will deliver us. No, we need no deliverance but the state, but science, but technology. 
And this is where we see social engineering that I've already discussed as a subset. I already talked to you about the problems of population control, which is classic social engineering. We see it in education, as I've mentioned, which is merely indoctrination. What is the goal of modern government at schools? To create distracted citizens and consumers who possibly can become machine gun fodder for the next time we need a war. The whole idea of seeking after truth and beauty and human flourishing is impossible under a technocratic relativist understanding of education. And the final one is plastic anthropology. This is the, the I think that this, this is in many ways a summary or a combination and fulfillment of all the other things I've listed. This is the idea that there is no real human nature and that the core of our being is fundamentally malleable. It combines technology and radical autonomy with equality and humanitarian efforts of comfort divorced from any consideration of the end or purpose or meaning of the man or woman. Now even human nature can be manipulated to achieve liberal socialist goals. A person can change his gender if he pleases. Man can make himself in whatever image he desires. But of course what will actually happen is that man will be made in the image of what others desire for him. As I've said before and I'll say again, man's power over nature, as Lewis reminds us, is some men's power over other men. So let me conclude and say, with the context of this global political cons consensus and technocracy, um, what are some of the challenges facing us? I think some of them are quite obvious. I, I don't need to go through them. The idea of the state attempt to redefine a biological and sociological reality of marriage. This is not an act of liberty. This is not getting the state out of marriage. This is the state redefining something that no other civilization has tried to do. Is this liberty or totalitarianism? When you have a state that tries to redefine biology, if you thought daylight savings time was bad in Michigan, trying to put your children to bed at like one in the morning, okay, last year at s it, was, it was seven o'clock, the second day of daylight savings, and my he was a four-year-old at the time, he said to my wife, is this lunch, mommy? I'm like, oh. Okay, all right. If you think that's bad, the state is trying to redefine biological realities and said, you will obey. You will obey. You see the challenges, of course, of gender and autonomy. And so you have people who are struggling. And what happens? Humanitarian social engineers are using people to achieve political goals. It's all in the terms of benevolence. It's not benevolent. It's not benevolent at all. And finally, eugenics and, gen and genetic manipulation. The eugenic movement became quite popular in the 1920s and 1930s in the United States and other parts of Europe. But after it was used by the Nazis, it became very unfashionable and was no longer promoted openly. However, with advances in biotechnology and genetics, Eugenics is now very much in vogue. With nanotechnology and genetic engineering, there are new developments, some of which are very positive, of course, but others which are fundamentally challenging the, uh, what it means to have a human nature. And there's no moral limitations to this because I already explained, we don't need morality, we're relativists and we're technologically superior to morality. Whatever can be done will be done. Now. Listen very carefully because I, I think you're seeing it, but unlike Nazi racist ideology, eugenics and genetic manipulation is humanitarian and compassionate. It's humanitarian. So, so we don't pay attention. Well, isn't it good? Aren't you pro-life? Yes, but we're also pro-human. We're also pro-liberty, pro-freedom, pro-family. In the United States, a couple, had a, a child, had it with a rare disease. And in order to heal the child, they needed a donor who was a relative with a, very, with a similar um, genetic requirements. So they couldn't find one. 
They looked and looked and looked, and they couldn't find one. But the doctor said, you know, you could try to make one. So the couple did in vitro fertilization and created a number of embryos. And then the doctors went through and found the embryo that had the right genetic mix. And they took that embryo and planted it and had the baby, and the other ones were disposed of. And the baby was born, and they were able to get the requisite donation and heal the older child. Now, in one sense, wow, isn't science great? I mean, we healed the child. In another sense, see the problem. We have instrumentalized a human person for the use of another. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the tip of the iceberg. From nanotechnology to neurology to intergeneral genetic manipulation, genetics is pushing limits. The best person to read on this is Dr. Leon Cass. I have one of his books in my reading list. Intergeneral gene genetic manipulation, I think you understand what that means, right? That means if you genetically manipulate me, it has actual impact on my generation. So C.S. Lewis in The Abolition of Man talks about this very thing. Conditioners are conditioning not only themselves, but subsequent generations. And this is a deep question of power. I would say, if you look, and I, I could be wrong, maybe I am, I doubt it. If you look at the theme, at the theme <laughs> rarely does that happen. Um, if you look at kind of threats of liberty from socialism, communism, German National Socialism of the Nazis, etc. The threat today is the technocracy and this seemingly benevolent, compassionate, humanitarian consensus. I think it's a threat to liberty, um, and I think sometimes we're not paying attention to it. Now, the rise of eugenics and genetic manipulation is going to be a serious challenge across the board. And it's not only a moral problem, it's a social problem. And it's not just limited to the United States. Let's go back for a second. Humanitarianism sees poor people as objects of our charity, objects of our pity, and objects of our compassion. But as we know, and I've already discussed, humanitarianism easily loses its veneer of compassion. What happens when we start to see poor people in the developing world as resources for our organs and the extension of our life? If you think I'm exaggerating, I am not. We're already seeing organ donation and sales from poor nations to wealthy clients in Europe and the United States. This is serious business. What's to prevent wealthy Westerners from seeing the poor as sources to extend their lives? Now at the core of this, and let me finish then, is really what it means to lead an authentic human life. The fundamental debates of our time are, I think, anthropological. What does it mean to lead a human life? Okay, I'm running out of time. So I, 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 I was gonna discuss consumerism, but I'm running out of time, right? I'm out of time? Not yet. Not yet? Oh, I have time. Okay. I'm, am I? He's well, the boss. If you want a question and answers. Then I should finish. Yeah, you got about 15 minutes. Okay. All right. So let me say this really fast. Okay. The final challenge I'd like to discuss. No, I'm kidding. I just went to an auction. I heard that. Okay. All right. So what I'd like to say really super quick about consumerism before I go to the conclusion is consumerism is also a serious problem. And in many ways, it's a summary description of all the other problems. We want to be able to buy or create the type of baby we want, the type of gender we want to be, the health we desire, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we tend to think of consumerism as a problem of capitalism, right? But it's not sufficient. Consumerism goes beyond an economic system into the deeper questions of human desire, human longings, and the purpose and the end of life. And further, cap consumerism is not limited to capitalist society. There was consumerism in poor societies, and there was consumerism in socialist societies. Okay. <clears throat> a couple things that need to, to be made with consumerism is it is true that a market economy can exacerbate consumerism. Okay. You can't say, oh, capitalism has no effect on consumerism. Of course it does. Right? I'm not saying that. Absolutely it does. Right. 
Um, but what we're seeing is sometimes in like the traditional interpretive grid of like the state versus the market, we see this a lot in Catholic social teaching, like there's the state and the market. And we can sometimes look to the state to kind of protect people from excesses of the market. But in the new political hybrid, the state and the market are working very close to one another because we are in crony capitalism, right? And so what happens is you see states and businesses working together to promote consumerism. In the United States, for example, consumer corporations advertise in public government schools. Right? So we can't simply look to the state to protect us. There's a really good book. She's a, a kind of, I think, a left-wing scholar. She's very interesting. Her name is Juliet Shore. It's not in your reading list. And it's, it's a book called Born to Buy. All right, and it is, it is like profound. I mean, it's a good book. I don't agree with everything she says in it, but it's totally worth reading. Right? I mean, Nickelodeon, MTV, and VH1 are all owned by the same company, right? So you start you off early, turn you right into like, you know, kind of a sentimentalist, and then MTV turns you into like a, a sexual narcissist, and then VH1 eases you into the grave. <laughs> so in some ways, consumerism um, is a contrasting attitude to traditional Jewish, Catholic, Christian, philosophical approach to the world. Consumerism is one of appropriation instead of reverence. It's having instead of being. And its causes are not primarily economic. Again, while I'm not denying the effects of economics on consumerism, its causes are not primarily economic. It is fundamentally a spiritual problem. So what do we do in the face of this? I think you know there are a lot of complex things going on. And what I wanted to do today was, as I said, give you a reprieve from politics and start to think about maybe some of the other kind of philosophical <coughs> undercurrents that are going on. Next week, my colleague is giving a talk, Todd Heisinger is giving a talk on his new book, The Totalitarian Temptation, where he actually will discuss some of, of, of these things in action in Europe, and, and it's not very far from the United States as well. His book is back there, and a big capitalist, a non-crony capitalist approach by his book today. Um, but, but I think you should, if you're interested in any of these ideas, definitely come and hear Todd, because he's going to talk about a lot of these kind of things in concrete. I'm, I'm doing more of a philosophical, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a prequel, right? Uh, what is a prequel? Anyway, all right. So uh, it's, this is the first lecture. So anyway, so that's the first. Um, but I think, first of all, what do we do? I think it's important to think about these things. Pay attention to the underlying currents. Sometimes amidst the political debates of right and left, we miss the forest for the trees. And I think we have, to, we have to pay attention to that. I think we have to realize that technology, with all of its benefits, also poses some serious dangers. And keep in mind Lewis's warning that man's power over nature is always some men's power over other men. In the beginning of the talk, of the talk uh, I, I had the, the Tower of Babel. And I think we keep that in our mind. Actually, I'll talk about that in a second. I think what we need to do is recognize the difference between crony capitalism and a free competitive market economy. And we need to work. I mean, that, that's a whole other lecture, which I'm working on. But I think being able to make the distinctions and make an argument. And when someone criticizes the managerial economy, especially if you're, okay, if you're a free marketer like I am, and somebody criticizes you know, the economy today, sometimes we're like, no. Like, yeah. Exactly. If sometimes if somebody criticized business, like, you know, business does this, we tend to kind of react. No, well, business is a moral enterprise, which it is. I've written about it. I think it's a moral enterprise. It's a wonderful thing. But a lot of times, businesses actually partner with the state, and they're not good, right? And don't be afraid to actually say, yes, I agree with you, and what's more, because I think we have to really recapture of what it means to have a free economy. Um, and fundamentally, we have to make the case not only through argument but through our lives of what it means to lead an authentic human life. What does death mean and suffering mean and mercy mean? The modern technocracy wants to eradicate death. They want to put it away. They want to do euthanasia, which is from the Greek, right? You or F meaning good and thanos, death, a good death. But it is not a good death to sanitize it and put it away. A good death is heroism and hope in the face of suffering and your final end. I've seen good deaths. And I've seen people who've cared for their spouses in the face of suffering. They were beautiful deaths. 
and the, the suffering and the patience and the hope of the dying person and the mercy and the care and the untiring love of the caregiver give a force of example for generations. That's a good death, not a technological sanitized death. Love and marriage are fundamentally human things that require sacrifice, self-giving, self-donation. They can't be solved with a pill and they can't be solved with neurology. And so making the case for an authentic human life, because people are searching for it, people are frustrated, people sense that something is broken with the Enlightenment project, that technocracy is not ultimately satisfying, and they're looking around. And more than argument is to live a life that actually tries to, man to, to manifest and live out these deepest human values. The new social challenges are, th are the, in many ways the thought of utilitarianism, technocracy, and pleasure seeking taken to its logical conclusion. So the, as I said, the fundamental debate is about what it means to be human. And I would argue that it is Christianity, Judaism and Christianity are the only one that can provide a serious alternative to techno-utopian pleasure seeking. But we can't engage the debate on their, own, on, our, on their terms. We have to engage in our terms. We don't battle on utilitarianism or social impact. We battle on authentic human life and a rich meaning of human existence. The modern consensus argues it can be attained by technology and radical autonomy, but it is a false promise. We don't even need Aldous Huxley's Brave New World to tell us that humanitarianism will end in the abolition of man. We are watching it happen. Technology will not solve our problems, nor is it all bad. It's done wonders for mankind, and many of us are live in the room because of technology. But it cannot tell us what's right or wrong. It cannot tell us what is humanizing or dehumanizing. This is where the churches must provide guidance. Despite the prevalence of techno-utopianism, and perhaps because of it, we see increasing anxiety, sadness, apprehension, confusion about sexuality, and on and on and on. And the technocracy wants to solve our problems with pharmacology, genetics, and consumerism. But that will only lead to more emptiness. Technology and the state cannot explain or solve the mystery of human sexuality and human love. Technology and the state cannot help one understand the beauty and power of redemptive suffering. Technology and the state cannot guide us through the mystery of death. Technology and the state cannot provide authentic community. Technology and the state cannot help build a civilization of love that only the family can do. Man is not redeemed by the state or by science or by economics man is redeemed by love, love of God and love of fellow human beings. We are in a debate about the most fundamental meaning of human life, the Tower of Babel, man's striving desire to be God. If you go back into this Genesis, man is created unto the image of God. He is not God, nor is he an animal. And this is the constant tension throughout history, that man is either trying to live like God or live like an animal. But we are supposed to live like man. That's what we were made to do. And that's where we find our fulfillment. The new technocracy and the global political consensus is as old as Sodom and Gomorrah and the Tower of Babel. Animalism or false gods. Part of our role is to strive to lead authentic human lives as we are created to, and in doing that, provide light and guidance to others. Thank you for your time.